Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Colony Drop, a Gundam podcast where we talk about everything from the manga to the Gundam anime series and really any topic related to Gundam. My name is Isaac. And my name is Brian. And today we are talking about one of the mainstays of Gundam, Space Colonies. Space Colonies, yeah. Brian, I think almost every Gundam series has a colony in it. There's I think only a few holdouts. <laughs> I think that's right for the most part. It, in, even for the holdouts, I feel like there's still some presence of a space colony, whether it's mentioned maybe in the past or maybe like they did exist at one point. But I, you're right. I feel like you, you almost can't have a Gundam series without space colonies. That's kind of what I really like about it because they're such a present part of Gundam. They're almost as ubiquitous within Gundam as like seeing like a mobile suit with a mono eye or seeing a Gundam itself. They're just such so embedded into the setting of Gundam. It's pretty shocking when you notice a Gundam series doesn't have colonies. <laughs> yeah. And why do you why do you think that is, Isaac? Okay. So Gundam came out in the nineteen seventies and this was during the height of the Cold War and the space race. Oh, the awesome space race. <laughs> and I feel like there was a lot of talk about colonizing space at the time. You know, there is some now, but back then it was, you know, oh boy, it was for the fate of the free world. <laughs> <laughs> against, against the commies taking over the solar system. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a big discussion was how would humans move into space? And so a lot of scientists presented ideas for colonies. So the Gundam animators and uh, story developers decided to fit colonies into the, the setting of Gundam. And then in addition to that, the idea of a space colony, it creates conflict, which is what you need for a good story, right? So that conflict is between those people who live in the colonies and those people who don't live in the colonies. And presumably because the colonies came second someone on earth is ruling over those people in the colonies and obviously at some point that's going to upset someone that's true almost always the conflict in every gundam series is between a colony the colonies and earth yeah people really hate those ruling ruling class (laughs) unless you're in a mobile fighter g gundam in which case it might be the other way around right you're you're, oh that's true yeah that that might be one of the only He'd love to get to one of those clean, <laughs> nice, safe colonies off the polluted Earth. That might be where right. we're headed. Like that movie, could, at least, right? <laughs> could, could be. Could be. It's not going so well right now on Earth. I wish I was on a colony right now. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I think that is relevant for really anything involving space colonies is what are called Lagrangian points or Lagrange points. And so we wanted to talk about these first because they're going to come up in pretty much every t- every Gundam timeline that we talk about space colonies for. So a Lagrange point, it's a physics concept. They're, they're points near two large bodies in orbit where a smaller object will maintain its position relative to the large orbiting bodies. So that is the Wikipedia definition. So I'm going to explain that in plain English now. <laughs> Say it in English, Doc. <laughs> so basically that's saying that colonies or colony clusters placed at the Lagrange points remain at those positions relative to the sun and the earth while the Earth orbits the Sun, and while the, the Sun and our solar system you know, fly through the universe. They're stable points of orbit, people, all right? They don't yeah. change. Yes, there are five Lagrange points. If you picture the Earth orbiting the Sun, there's one in front of the Earth, one behind the Earth, one to the left of the Earth, one to the right of the Earth, and then one directly opposite the Earth on the other side of the Sun. And those same five points that exist between the Sun and the Earth also exist between the Earth and the Moon. So... There's one Lagrange point behind the moon, in front of the moon, to the left of the moon, to the right of the moon, and on the opposite side of the Earth as the moon. So this works for any two orbiting bodies, in this case, either the sun and the Earth or the Earth and the moon. And in Gundam's case, it uses the Earth-Moon system, Lagrange points. You know what, for our listeners, imagine, ironically for Gundam, almost a peace symbol. (laughs) Yeah, kind of. where the lines intersect, those are more or less the uh, the, the Lagrange points, the L points. Yep. And there, I mean, there's <sighs> some pretty irony. cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's no peace happening. We're living those in a peace points. symbol. Yeah, we live in a peace symbol, but every three years there's a, a massive war. <laughs> there's so many wars. I don't really understand how there's any people left in Gundam. Funny you should mention that. We might talk about a series where uh, 
takes place after the wars. Ooh, mm. Ooh more than one, one series, actually. Wow. <laughs> Zing, but um. <laughs> there are some really cool diagrams, at least for the Universal Century, the main Gundam timeline, um, that show where the Lagrange points are, as well as what colonies are at what Lagrange points. You know, if you watch a lot of the series, sometimes they'll say, oh, we're going to side two or side six or side four. And, um, you know, if you open up the map once in a while, it's it's pretty interesting to be like, oh, that's where that happened. So kind of neat. Yeah. Well, the good thing, too, about the Gundam map, if you ever, I mean, come on, anyone listening to this, if you're a real fan, you should have seen this map by now. But anyways, let's say you pull up a map of like uh, the Earth sphere. That map almost never changes. <laughs> <laughs> the Lagrand point, they don't move. That's the whole point of the point. Yep. Yeah. That's the point of the point. <laughs> so, you know, the moon's going to be in the same spot. You know, it's uh, for whatever reason, they almost never change the names of the sides. You know, Crossbone Vanguard got a little weird where they called it like Frontier Side or whatever. But it was still the Earth Sphere. There was one reorganization of the of the colonies in uh, UC84, I believe. But for I the most part, that. once you have the, the map in your head, it gives some some context as to where all this stuff is happening. It's not happening in okay. like deep space. It's happening literally mostly around earth. And that's kind of why people can travel somewhat quickly in Gundam. Yeah. I don't think we'll, Oh, I'm not sure how this would even go. I'd be surprised if we saw a Gundam series that was like taking place across the breadth of the galaxy. That, yeah. They might be yeah. faster ships. Maybe if that, yeah. Yeah, then we have other problems because, I don't know. Minowski particles are stretching it enough. <laughs> <laughs> we reached the limits of <laughs> believability. But, um. Yeah. And then one one last thing before we, we start I wanted to mention is thinking about space colonies in general and thinking about you know Gundam, which is a show that is about wars basically occurring at or around space colonies. Think about how terrifying that would be in person. It, it, or in reality if you're living in a space colony you're essentially living in a metal tube and you're in a fishbowl brian yeah you're you're in a fish <laughs> it, it, it would be like flying around on earth in an airplane living in that airplane if someone comes and blows a hole in your home <laughs> you <Yeah>. are screwed <laughs> i'm not sure well <laughs> that's a big debate too like right like all right let's already jump into this brian if you're in like a a cylinder colony <laughs> And someone, like, puts a crack in the glass. I mean, is the colony done for? Is the evacuation start? Or is it something they kind of expect and, like, a, a sort of patch team gets deployed? Oh, I got it. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you can make those things without a without a plan for a breach. Yeah. I mean, breaches obviously happen a few times in the series. Yeah. And I, I think every time they, you know, they, they deploy people to go fix it or they deploy that sticky stuff that plugs the hole, at least temporarily. Yeah. Um, which is probably the greatest invention, yeah. <laughs> the greatest invention, I guess, if you're living in a space colony. But just in general, the, the fragility of life in a space colony. You know, they, they do a good job of playing that up in some of the series, um, but it, it could be even played up more, in my opinion. I feel like depending on the size of, you know, whatever hole happened to get put into your colony, you would notice nothing. You'd notice a breeze. Or you'd eventually notice like gale force winds and then you'd be lifted off your feet towards your death. <laughs> yes. You just, I guess you just don't want to be where that hole is. No, no. <laughs> so should we, should we discuss the, the, the types of colonies in Gundam based on order of release maybe? Or how, how would you like to do this? Hmm. I'm not sure. Actually, yeah, let's do that because one type of colony is essentially <laughs> the type of colony for Gundam. <laughs> More or less, right? I mean, th this type of yeah. colony has yeah. appeared in the vast majority of series, and it, it's pretty iconic. I don't think I've ever seen it in any other science fiction at all, now that I think about it. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I mean, Gundam has sort of a monopoly on this colony, or at least... That's if right. someone else used this colony, I'd be like, oh, look, it's a Gundam show. <laughs> Brian, why don't you tell our listeners what's the name of that colony? So the Universal Century, the main Gundam timeline, uses what's called the O'Neill Island 3 Colony Cylinder, or just the O'Neill Cylinder for short. This is a design created by an American physicist. His name was Gerard O'Neill, and his students actually helped come up with this as well, I believe. Uh, this was created in the <laughs> 1970s. 
I'm curious yeah. what his students did. Like, uh, so I, my, my <laughs> understanding is solar panels. <laughs> they were like, all right, it's going to need energy. <laughs> well, my understanding is that him and his students actually worked out like all the calculations to prove that okay, his design would would be feasible. So they yeah. they figured out you know that it had to have two counter rotating cylinders to provide approximately one g of gravity for people living on the inside. And they figured out how many times they would need to rotate the cylinders per day to get that level of gravity. They figured out how they would have to turn the mirrors to, you know, to provide the right amount of energy and, and that kind of thing. Right. So, you know, Mr. O'Neill here, he, he did quite a lot of work on this in the 70s. Clearly, it was a, a passion project of his. Um, there were similar cylinder designs for colonies proposed um, a little bit earlier. There was a German scientist named Hermann Oberth. He proposed a cylinder in 1954. And then the uh, famous British sci-fi writer, Arthur C. Clarke, he wrote 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, he also used a cylindrical colony design in one of his works. But the one that we see most of the time in Gundam is the one designed by Gerard O'Neill. So the O'Neill cylinder. As far as uh, some technical information, the average size of an O'Neill cylinder is 6.4 kilometers in diameter with a length of 36 kilometers. So these things are pretty massive. I imagine an infantry battle inside one would be a very lengthy affair if both sides decided not to use mobile suits and (laughs) needed to take the colony (laughs) for whatever reason. By sheer manpower, it would not be a quick battle. (laughs) Correct, yes. Uh, I know Americans hate the metric system, so we'll we'll convert it to miles for (laughs) for everyone here. So that would be about four miles in diameter and 22 miles in length. And the circumference is about 12 and a half miles. So I think that would put it, if I did that right, that would put, if you unfold the cylinder, right, and lay it out. I think that would be Open about it. 275 square miles in the colony. But getting a little bit more technical, each colony, the, the inside is composed, or the cylinder, I guess, is composed of six strips. And three of those strips are glass that allow light in. Mm-hmm. And three of them are sort of your land. And so there's 275 square miles of total area, but only half of it would be livable because the other half is glass. So you you need your window, right, to let in the light. So it's pretty big, though, like you said. This isn't like the International Space Station. This is a large city. San Francisco is 49 square miles. It's 7 by 7. So if a colony is 275 square miles and half of that is livable, that's 137.5 square miles. And if San Francisco is 49 square miles, that is approximately three San Franciscos in each colony. Man. So there you go. It's a lot of people in there, although not necessarily people, because the good thing about colonies is that they can be used for all numbers. Well, really anything. There's been military colonies. There's been colonies devoted only to beef, um, <laughs> like Texas colony. But the, vast, the vast majority of colonies are definitely, you know, for civilians. They're just living spaces for uh, the bulk of uh, humanity. Something interesting I learned about the colonies, Brian, is that the mirrors, the three massive mirrors, they're not actually for power generation. They're actually for reflecting the sunlight. I didn't know that till I was doing some research. And the colonies themselves actually adjust the angle of the mirror throughout the year to mimic the seasons of the Earth. So... Say for summer, they'll be letting in way more light than opposed to uh, winter, where they usually, uh, you know, scale back the uh, probably the temperature and the sunlight a bit. That's right, I, but I believe they also close the mirrors to simulate uh, nighttime as well. Correct? Wow, I wouldn't know. <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> yeah. not. I don't know. That might be really claustrophobic. I think I might like the night sky if I live in a colony. <laughs> if they just, if you know, if they just locked me in, that uh, that might draw some. Uh, some problems with my mental health. I don't know. Speaking of locked in and mental health, Uh there's actually more than one type of colony in the universal century. We have our O'Neill open types, which are the ones we just talked about. They have the glass and over at side three, Xeon, they got the closed type colonies, Brian, because side three is behind the moon and they don't get any sunlight. (laughs) (laughs) I believe they built those closed-type colonies because they were cheaper. 
and they could hold twice as many people. That's very true. They did. And in addition to that, they're essentially, um, well, doubled their industrial capacity more or less because they have more people. So uh, technically, Xeon might have been a double side. They had the strength and the uh, the resources of two sides more or less, which sort of explains why they were so successful to a degree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it also explains why they were so depressed and overcrowded because why they're called closed types is for those three strips of glass, you replace them with three strips of livable space. So that means there's double the amount of people in your colony, but no light, which means that your sky is going to be super gray and drab. And just knowing that you're living on the cheap colony, I don't know, can't do a lot for your <laughs> for your morale. That's pretty depressing. I would want to revolt if, if, if I lived there as well. That makes sense, yeah. I, if I remember from when we see inside side three, there's like sort of a central column in the middle of the colony, and it's it's essentially a glorified fluorescent light. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> Which, sad. Yeah, that combined with like the own internal atmosphere just making a, a gray cloud along the middle. Yeah, it's a bit grim. <laughs> yeah, and this type of colony, this closed type colony, is apparently closer to a design uh, that was come up with by a guy named Henry Gray in 1971, which he called a vivarium, or maybe a vivarium. I'm not sure how Mr. Gray pronounces that. but So that one predates the O'Neill cylinder a little bit, but yeah, closed type. So that's why Xeon's you know, mad, because they live in a, a depressing type of colony. <laughs> pretty much, but I will say this about the colonies in the Universal Century. They're pretty robust. How many times in the intro do we see a nuke going off inside of a colony and like the colony just gets flooded with light, but the explosion barely leaks out of the colony. You know, the <laughs> colony isn't like shattered into a thousand pieces. I mean, I wonder if that last. would really happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah I, I do think if you blew up a, a nuke in a colony, I, I do think it should it should probably be destroyed. But I guess those universal century colonies, they're made of stern stuff. Right. I mean, we don't know where Xeon put the nuke or what the yield was. For all we know, it was it was oh, a pretty true. light light yield. You know? Yeah, yeah. It could be a mini one. <laughs> one thing I did notice that's interesting is that the O'Neill cylinder design is supposed to have sort of concentric counter rotating cylinders. But in Gundam the, the colonies only have one cylinder. So the Gundam O'Neill cylinders are not really necessarily scientifically accurate. I think it depends like what series we're watching because I remember in 0083, <laughs> Nina specifically points out how important the pair the pairing of colonies is, and she uses like these two glasses that she takes <laughs> out and puts them on a table and like rotates them and you know makes some kind of touch, and that's when they realize I think that the colonies that uh, the, the lost fleet has like hijacked or you know going to collide oh. and go out of control but i think that goes back to the yeah. to the lagrange points yeah maybe because so this is a good point to bring up in the universal century there are a lot of colonies and those colonies are organized into what are called sides so think of sides as just clusters of colonies and those sides are what are at the lagrange points so you can have more than one thing at the Lagrange point and still have it be in a, in a stable relative you know, position. Oh. So I think what Nina was pointing out in 83 is that maybe the colonies at that Lagrange point had probably moved because one of them had been moved out of the Lagrange point. So it affected the, the position of all the other colonies that were normally stable. They had probably moved a little bit because some of the mass had, had shifted away and so it affected the gravitational uh, forces on all the other colonies that remained at that Lagrange point I see uh, that makes sense but I agree that depending on who's running the show and what's happening in the episode they play kind of fast and loose with any uh, scientific laws and <laughs> theory <laughs> sometimes we'll see a colony by itself sometimes we'll see its mirrors pointing away from the sun you know anything can happen maybe we'll even see it like perpendicular to the sun <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it really doesn't matter for the purposes of the story or, or at least very rarely will the uh, the science be required <laughs> yeah i mean it is a show about robots after all at the end of the day so exactly close yeah. enough brian the o'neill type colony appears in so many different series we see the universal century 
We see it in correct century for a little bit, which for our listeners who might not be aware is in turn A Gundam. It's used in Gundam X or the after war Ah, timeline. Yeah, that's true. Oh, God. That might be my favorite intro to a Gundam series ever where they explain (laughs) like (laughs) they explain that in this timeline, which might be the universal century. I don't know. The Earth sphere is in their seventh space war. So, man, things are bad. (laughs) <laughs> and the bad guys or at least one of the factions decides that in order to win the war they drop almost all the colonies i think they only save maybe two or at least a handful but every other colony just dozens of them get dropped on earth it's pretty awesome and horrifying at the same time do you know how many people died as a result of those oh boy i don't know the population of earth at the time but it must have been untold billions it was 9 billion people perished. Wow. Wait, Only, what, you mean, hang on. Do you mean just on Earth or including the population of the colonies? I believe total. Wow. Only 98 million people remain after. That is insane. You know <laughs> what? I mean, we'll talk about this when we do our Gundam X episode. The determination or control that these villains had where they dropped colonies filled with people onto earth because there's there's no way brian that you can evacuate dozens of colonies and put their populations into like just two other colonies (laughs) yeah that's not gonna work (laughs) yeah those people i don't know if they they died before they got to earth or what happened but my god they can't have all died the humanity that's that's human Yeah. yeah Yeah, that show is less about the colonies and more about the after effects of all of the colonies being dropped. Pretty yeah, horrible sure. timeline to live in. We also see O'Neill types in, very briefly, in, in Iron-Blooded Orphans. God, I think they're only there for like two episodes, maybe one episode. Yeah, they were so briefly there that I, I don't even remember seeing them. But I mean, we did see yeah. the, the Dort colony, so I assume it was a picture of the, the Dort yeah. colony, I guess. It was an O'Neill colony, and they were there so briefly, there was nothing out of the ordinary for it. So, yep. um, let's see. Oh, Gundam AGE. They also use O'Neill cylinders. That's right. Yeah. And uh, as the namesake of our uh, podcast, let me just say that out of all the colonies dropped in every Gundam series, the leader, <laughs> the first place goes to uh, O'Neill type colonies for being the most commonly dropped colony <laughs> in any Gundam series. <laughs> <laughs> They're just designed to throw, Brian. <laughs> just nice little lawn darts you just lob at the earth. Exactly. It's a space a javelin. Mark. Yeah. Space space javelin. Space javelin. <laughs> yeah. O'Neill cylinders are also used in build fighters. The the kingdom where Reggie is from is a O'Neill cylinder colony. Nice. It's oh, not really nice. elaborated on more than that, but it is just noteworthy that it is an O'Neill cylinder. So how many is that now? We have build fighters, iron blooded orphans. Uh, AGE, Universal Century, uh, Gundam X, and they were also in Gundam Seed. Uh, Most of the colonies are not O'Neill cylinders, but there are some uh, O'Neill cylinders. One (laughs) heroes colony, (laughs) as well as another one that we'll talk about later. But that most of the most of the colonies in Gundam Seed are are not uh, are not O'Neill cylinders. But it's worth noting that that is what seven. Did I count that right? Seven series. I think so. That sounds about right. Did Double O have? O'Neill's or did it not? Uh, no, Double O has um, what are called Bernal spheres. Oh, Bernal spheres. That's why it was forgettable then because we didn't spend much yeah. time there. <laughs> they didn't Sorry. really show many colonies, yeah. Well, Brian, let's talk about the sides in the Universal Century. So as I mentioned, the colonies in the Universal Century are organized into clusters called sides. So I wanted to mention some interesting things about some of the sides that might help you if you're watching the Universal Century um, to keep in mind. Um, because I don't know that we really, you know, they they mention the sides by numbers in a lot of series, but they don't really give a whole lot of context. So you kind of have to do a little reading to kind of figure it out. Now, obviously, everyone knows that side three is Zeon, for example, but um, some of the other ones are kind of interesting. So side one is the Federation space capital. I can't say Ooh. I knew that offhand. No, and it must have been as meaningless in the course of the <laughs> war as it is to us now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Side two is where Xeon took a colony to drop on Earth for Operation British. So that's pretty uh, noteworthy. Side two is also where the Zanscare Empire comes from in Victory Gundam. That's obviously a lot later on. You see 149 to 153. But, you know, in the beginning, you're dealing with side three. 
little do you know later on side two is going to be your problem <laughs> yeah god what did side two go through that turned it into the zanscare empire arguably by some fans the the epitome of evil in the universal century but we'll get to that when we discuss uh the zanscare empire and uh gun uh, v gundam uh side three again zeon you know zeon had a somewhat little bit happier ending they did receive more colonies in the uc uh 80s to ease their overcrowding problem but yeah everyone everyone already knows about zeon side four is where gundam the thunderbolt takes place that's where the thunderbolt sector is located so that's basically like a sort of <laughs> just messed up debris field mobile suits uh, capital ships colony pieces just a not a very nice place to be can i ask you a question about thunderbolt brian sorry to get yep. us off on a tangent yep all right if my understanding the thunderbolt area is from what i read is a uh, vital supply lane to a Balaku, and that's the whole reason for the plot. My understanding of Gundam canon just makes my head spin at that logic. That makes <laughs> no sense because a Balaku is like the doorstep of Side 3. There is no supply line. It's literally at like the front of, of the Xeon homeland. But anyways, I digress. <laughs> that's all I wanted to say. Comment below if you agree with me or you disagree with me. Anyways, well, please. <laughs> I mean, I guess it could be because it used to be... Why, why, why not? Because it used to be at Lagrange point five, and then it was moved to Lagrange point one. But a so, Balaku is right by side three. There oh. is no yeah. Oh, I, yeah. Okay, I see. You're saying relative yeah. to um, to a Balaku. Um, right. It could be that they have something at side four that they don't have at side three. Okay, I'll I'll give them that. I'll say there's some vital supplies coming in, whether it's resources or food supply or something that they need for a Balaku. All right. <laughs> go back down <laughs> um, side 4 was also as Isaac mentioned rebuilt in Gundam F91 as the uh, frontier side uh, our friends at side 5 that is where the battle of loom happened which you can see oh, in the Gundam the origin TV show there must be nothing left <laughs> yeah that, that one is also pretty much a shoal zone as they call it filled with debris just like side 4 um, but you know Isaac your pals at the Delaz fleet they're from side yeah. five. So that's their headquarters. Oh, and, uh, you mean the Garden of Thorns. That's what they, they built in the ruins there? I see. Yeah. Side six, they also declared independence from the Earth Federation, just like Xeon. But instead of going to war, they played nice and, and you know kept up their diplomatic relations. And instead of, <laughs> instead of getting attacked, they became neutral. And uh, you can see side six in 0080 War in the Pocket, that colony that the story takes place on, the Li- Libot colony. That's why they're neutral, because they declared independence and they're just sort of not participating in the war. So let me say this. <laughs> How neutral can you be if, you, <laughs> if you're like hosting the research project for like the Federation's latest super web, latest mobile suit? <laughs> Well, you, you've got a point there. Now, I don't know that the Liebot colony knew that the Federation was, was doing that. Um, perhaps the, the Federation was doing it in secret. But you are probably on to something there. I mean, I, I believe that Side 6 did rejoin the Federation shortly after the the one-year war at some point. So maybe kind of realized that there wasn't a, wasn't a whole lot of point to being separate. Plus, the Federation could also just say, well, look what happened to Side 3. Are you sure you want to stay independent? <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like <laughs> they tried playing both sides off, but they really ended up becoming like w- within an inch of being annihilated. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah they almost got another. nuked, right? They really would have tested your nuke theory about this. Yeah, those. I'd, I'd love, on behalf of Xeon, I'd love to test this nuke theory. <laughs> I'm going to put a nuke at every area I think it might be critical and see if I could actually one shot a colony. <laughs> <laughs> send one right over to Liebot. It'll take it. We'll do it. <laughs> Side 7 is important because that's where the original Mobile Suit TV series begins. Uh, that's with the attempted uh, Gundam Jack show. Yay. Side 7 was furthest from well, everything else. That is else. correct. Yep. Side 7 is located at Lagrange Point 3, which is the one that is on the opposite side. Yeah. So furthest from the battles furthest from the eyes of Zeon, or so the Federation thought. But it turned out Zeon was willing to send a strike team over there and uh, try to take out that Gundam. 
And last but not least, Side 8. Side 8 was created as part of the G-Savior story. <laughs> so you know what that means, Isaac. I sure do. Actually, no, I don't. What does that mean, Brian? <laughs> it means it doesn't really exist. <laughs> You're right. It doesn't. And a little bit of trivia for all you G Savior fans. <laughs> By that point in the Universal Century, they stopped calling them colonies. And they ended up calling them settlements by that point because they felt they really weren't colonies. They were full fledged developed settlements. And uh, that's just how the majority of humanity lived. Yeah, I believe at that, at that point also the Federation was losing control. So can't really be a colony if your ruler sort of isn't ruling anymore, I suppose. <laughs> Even more G-Saver trivia, Brian. <laughs> by that point, the Federation was gone. It had been replaced by an organization called Consent, which stands for Congress of Settlement Nations, I believe. Mm. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Nobody cares. <laughs> you know what? We're going to test that nuke theory on consent. <laughs> Without their consent. But um... <laughs> Oh, boy. I, uh, I think that's all the sides. I, I do believe there are some colonies at some point around Jupiter. I don't think they're ever given a side designation, though. So I don't think there's a side nine yet, anyway. No, if they're by Jupiter, I'm going to guess they're by. They're going to control the Jupiter Empire. So. Yeah. You know, who knows what they look like. I assume it's a dystopian nightmare living there. I don't know. Fans probably don't know much about the Jupiter Empire, but they're just, they're the worst. All right. I think they like, <laughs> they, they'd like tattoo like a number on your forehead or something like that. Something crazy, if I remember correctly. Maybe I'm thinking wrong, but yeah, it's very much a, a dystopian society to live in. <laughs> I just imagine it's like a big floating head of Paptimus. <laughs> no. Man, I wonder what they think of him. Well, probably highly, or maybe low, because like he kind of failed. Yeah, he did fail. <laughs> he he did really well, but then he kind of failed. So yeah, yeah. So the next series up after Universal Century, in terms of a TV release, would be G Gundam or the Future Century. Ooh. So why don't you why don't you tell us a little bit about the quote colonies <laughs> that exist in this uh, in this show, Isaac? Okay. And I'm sure the fans know by now and my friends know by now, especially Brian, that I'm not the biggest fan of G Savior. I think it's a little silly and it, it was essentially, you know, Street Fighter Gundam because um, that was the hype at the time. It was the big trend. But the colonies in this are actually kind of awesome. I kind of like them in a way. <laughs> They're very fun. I'll say this. They're very fun. The colonies are reflections of the countries that built them. I'll give you the quick rundown. And saying of G Savior. Uh, the Earth is like a polluted Gundam. wasteland. Uh, sorry. Whoa, oh, boy. <laughs> In the setting of G Gundam, I'm mixing up my Gs. I'm mixing up my Gs. How Can I just say, how dare you yeah. mix up G Gundam <laughs> with G Savior? Comment, comment below to give Isaac a virtual slap <laughs> for daring, for blasphemy, for, for mixing up G Savior and G Gundam. Well, multiple times, I might yeah. add. <laughs> Anyways, I digress. Let me recoup. In this setting, in G Gundam, the Earth had gone through, I think, a pretty bad world war, and it's also polluted. So the wealthy and the powerful built space colonies and saved themselves. They booked it. They left everybody else on Earth, and the colonies they built are reflections of their individual countries. Each colony is called Neo, and then the country it came from. So Neo Egypt, you know, it has the the pyramids on it and the Sphinx. It's very much a tribute to their history. Japan, Neo Japan, is you know the Japanese home islands, um, but in space and uh, Neo America. America, it's like a, a star with like the Statue of Liberty on it and I think Mount Rushmore, <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> Each country really, you know, took like their their monuments and whatever makes them visually unique and just decided to design a colony around that and put it in a space. So I always thought they were pretty awesome. And they actually have like a bunch of secret weapons on it too that they use at the end of the series. <laughs> Some may paint their country in a better light than others. For example, Neo Mexico is a sombrero. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think they might not take themselves as seriously as like some countries take themselves, right? They're like, you know what? We're gonna have fun with our colony, and it's also a good. It's it's actually a good um astronomical shape or uh, aeros for aerospace engineering purposes. It actually makes sense. <laughs> but it's such a permanent decision. Do you think people voted on the sombrero from New, from New Mexico? No, I, 
I doubt. Well, whoever's no, there was no voting by this point. It was just you know, the wealthy and powerful or whatever was left of their governments decided. You know, you know what? We have to go with something. <laughs> <laughs> I guess to an extent, it's like designing a flag, right? You have to you have to think, okay, what visually can I create where people will look at our colony and know instantly what country we are? And then I'm sure somebody raised their hand and said a sombrero, and they're like, oh, okay, <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> fair, fair. I mean, I, I guess I shouldn't expect too much from Neo Mexico. They did right. <laughs> contribute uh, tequila Gundam to the Gundam fight, so right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Depending on if you're watching the dub or the sub, it's Tequila Gundam or Cactus Gundam. Yeah. <laughs> really like to uh, not take ourselves too seriously down there in New Mexico. <laughs> Here to have a good time and win lots of fights. <laughs> yes. So needless to say, the G Gundam colonies are not based on any sort of scientific design whatsoever. That's true. So. And let me say this about G Gundam. I don't think the concept of a colony drop is even discussed once, right? No, why would you want to drop your sombrero? I know. Well, <laughs> I don't even think they think of dropping. Oh, spoiler alert! Oh boy, I don't even think they think of dropping like Neo Japan. You know, when the situation starts going poorly, right? They're just kind of like, well, we're just gonna fight it out. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I don't think they ever. I don't think they ever discuss the colony drop. But I mean, imagine if you dropped that Neo America. That thing would do some damage. It's got point. It's got five points on that bad boy. That's true, yeah. Although, I don't know. Who knows what it'll look like by the time it reaches the lower atmosphere. It, yeah. it could just be a blob of red-hot molten metal. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you Dublin it, Brian, in which case it'll <laughs> land intact. <laughs> oh, Dublin. You can we'll walk off it if you time it right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next up in the chronological release order? It is Gundam Wing, which takes place in the After Colony timeline, Brian. The show, like the Universal Century, uses a colony design that is based on an actual scientific design. The colonies in Gundam Wing are based on what's called the Stanford Island 2. And this is a design proposed by NASA in 1975. It's similar to the UC design in that the mirrors provide light and there's some rotation going on to provide gravity. But the shape is completely different. It's shaped like a what's called a torus, which is basically a skinny donut. Is that a fair description of a torus, Isaac? I would describe it as, imagine a bicycle wheel and the rubber part of the wheel internally inside that, say the opposite side of the actual grip, that's where the city is. So it's a long, it's, it's along that equator of the colony. Yeah, you live in the donut. Yeah, you live in the donut with your head pointed towards the donut hole. Yeah, yeah. and there's a little hub in the middle where it with you know little like spokes that kind of connect the outer ring to the hub, um, and I think that's where ships dock and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I couldn't find any actual size estimates for the ones in Gundam Wing, but the actual like proposed sizes by NASA are are much smaller than the O'Neill cylinders. So the diameter here is only one mile ish, and the circumference is only three and a half miles. So quite a bit smaller than the O'Neill cylinders. Now, I don't know if it's supposed to be that small in Gundam Wing. Who, who knows? It could be you know, much, much larger. I'd say probably. I mean, if you remember the few scenes there are inside the colonies, it definitely comes off as more cramped. And um, to an extent, I guess the, the ceiling, so to speak, seems lower, even for the colonies that have tall buildings and skyscrapers. I can only speak for myself, but I am not a fan of these colonies. They're just too closed off there's like almost no windows really they just seem very claustrophobic in a way and sort of not slapped together but i don't think any two colonies are the same we see some that are sort of bicycle like where it's two uh toruses connected by like a, a very long connecting structure we see some where it's multiple torus rings um, on top of each other it just overall i think wasn't a very visually interesting design which my belief is why we never saw it again <laughs> it is only in the gundam wing series it's only an after colony it never shows up anywhere else do i remember this right that there's only really five colonies there's one at each lagrange point and each of the gundams in the show basically came from one of those colonies i think that's right yeah so i believe they yeah. call themselves like for example 
colony L1, and that, that basically just means the colony at Lagrange point one. Yeah. I always wonder if that meant an individual structure of a colony, or did that mean L1 would refer to like the collective group of the colonies there? Yeah. I but mean, I it, took it as yeah. one colony, but yeah, it could be. It was always kind of vague in Gundam Wing. They show a colony, and you never really got a good sense of where exactly it was, and yeah. But either way, just like Universal Century, those colonies located at those Lagrange points. Because <laughs> that's how physics works. Yeah. From what I read, the original plan of Operation Meteor, which for all you Gundam Wing fans, was the original plan to attack the Earth with the Gundams and liberate the colonies, was to uh, kick things off by dropping colonies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how um, or where the population of these colonies would go. But um, that was their original plan that they didn't go ahead with. And thankfully not, because the Gundams themselves are powerful enough. They don't need help from anybody against those useless Leos. (laughs) Ah, the mighty Leo. Yeah. (laughs) Talk about overkill. I mean, do you really need the Gundams after you drop all the colonies? Apparently they thought so to mop up whatever would be left after five colony drops. But you know what? Even that's optimistic, that thinking they could get away with five colony drops. If I remember... The Leos might not have been too powerful, but it's one thing to fight a Gundam. It's another thing to, you know, have your forces in space blow away a colony. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds pretty doable, I think. Yeah. So Gundam Wing, in summary, at least it used a different design to be original, but they were well, pretty ugly. Yeah, it'll always be remembered for being a, a different design, but if you have to choose between living in an O'Neill uh, open type or living in a, um, a Taurus... I'd be surprised if somebody picked a Taurus. Agree. I would choose the O'Neill. Yeah. So next up is Gundam X, which we've already talked about. They use the familiar O'Neill cylinder. Should we just skip that one, I guess, and go right to Seed? Yeah. So okay. um, Seed. Seed is kind of unique in that it has, well, I, I think this might have been an attempt to dethrone the O'Neills with a new design. <laughs> <laughs> so in Gundam Seed, which takes place in the Cosmic Era, we see two types of colonies. The first type is our regular O'Neill colony. Uh, our protagonist, Kira Yamato, he starts off at a, a normal colony, a normal O'Neill open type. But the other colony that is uh, very frequently shown throughout the series is called a plant. It's a plant, Brian. you got to water your plants. <laughs> oh, Seed really loved like the whole plant pun. You know, yeah. Gundam Seed had plant colonies, and they I believe they named them after, like, the, what was it? The calendar? It wasn't even the regular calendar. It was like the Roman calendar. So oh, okay. Like, names like Junius and uh, April, Aprilius, things like yeah. that. But you know, in general, Gundam Seed went acronym crazy. Remember, they gave Gundam an acronym name. It was oh, like yeah. General Utility. I don't know something else. Yep. You know, plants a name too. Plant stands for Productive Location Ally on Nexus Technology, which sounds like the most scientific gibberish someone in marketing <laughs> threw together to make a, an acronym for plant. <laughs> yeah, that one seems really forced. That seems like some of the bills that come out of Congress. As far as population of the colonies, it's bigger than I thought it was. A population in a plant can reach two million. That seems huge for. I guess what it appears to be not too big of a structure. What do you think, Brian, about that? Two million is pretty big, yeah. I guess I, I don't know how many colonies there are in, in Gundam Seed. I felt like Gundam Seed was really the only other series that had maybe as many colonies as Universal Century, or at least I felt like there were as many colonies in Gundam Seed as there were in Universal Century. So I, I don't know. I, I guess it depends on how many people are living in space. So for like example, in Universal Century, at least 9 billion people at some point are living in space. If you only put 2 million in each colony, that means you have a lot of colonies. Um, yeah, that's So I'm true. not sure in Gundam Seed how many people are actually living in the colonies. but mm, Well, I think Zaft had 12 plants, if I recall. And let's say each of those do max out at 12 million. So there's 24 million people. Um, essentially all the other colonies were just supposedly destroyed at the beginning of the first war between, um, the Earth Alliance and Zaft. But yeah, it's the, the thing about the cosmic era and Gundam Seed is that it's almost very 
more than other series, except for maybe Gundam X, it's literally Earth versus space, Earth versus the colonies. Um, there's no, you know, one side colony that's kind of neutral or, you know, Luna's a little bit neutral. No, it's much more cut and dry. This is very black and white in terms of uh, the, the factions involved. So I always thought that was kind of interesting, and I guess that kind of explained why they wanted the colonies to have such a, a different visual look and to be so bunched together. Agree, that makes sense. This design to me seems the least feasible. Why don't you describe how a how a plant <laughs> looks? They're almost like very lean hourglass shapes, but instead of sort of having that kind of onion bulb in the middle that a lot of hourglasses have, these ones are just you know straight diagonal lines towards the center. And the bottom parts, the round disc at the bottom, or uh, at either end, really, where uh, the population actually lives, are just flat, flat circles. That's where the two million will live. I assume one million on each side. Yeah. So to me, this design, out of all the designs we see in Gundam for Space Colony, seems the least feasible because it seems very fragile. It definitely looks unstable. Yeah. It's supposed to be 30 kilometers long which okay. is pretty massive. It's technically long. Yeah, it's longer than an O'Neill colony. Mm-hmm. But yeah, these colonies just look not just unstable, but a complete waste of space and resources, really. I mean, for the size they are, they put their people on a pretty small area of it, wouldn't you say? I, I agree. Yeah, it definitely seems oddly designed. And I, I just feel like, what if a mobile suit just flies by and nips that real thin part in the in the center do they just <laughs> float away from each other doomed it's funny you mention that brian because if you watch gundam seed every time the alliance like loads up their mobile armors with nukes and decides to make a run at the plants <laughs> they always aim right for the middle because they know that is the weakest part and if they just fracture that in the slightest if you watch the nukes go off they don't even like blow away that middle they just kind of like the nuke goes off and it just warps the middle i yeah. guess with the, sh- with the sheer heat the whole colony gets destroyed <laughs> yeah because it, then it changes the whole tension structure of, yeah. of, of the colony it probably just rips itself in half <laughs> These yeah it just don't really need much to, to be destroyed <laughs> it's it seems like a terrible design if i'm being if i'm being yeah. honest i if i was given the opportunity to live in the plant the uh the, the after colony taurus or the o'neill cylinder i'm still taking the o'neill cylinder i haven't seen an upgrade yet <laughs> i don't blame you i mean say what you will about the o'neill cylinder but you can sort of look up in the sky and you know things are bad and you need to evacuate like you don't need to wait for somebody to tell you you can <laughs> you can tell when there's enemy ships around <laughs> yeah this is just fragile little cones yeah i assume they put the science out the window because there doesn't seem to be any logic or rationale to them being so tightly clustered together. If you look at images of Zaft and uh, of the plants, they look like they're, oh God, a few dozen kilometers away from each other. <laughs> so, and, which, and the which Earth in Alliance, space is not far. <laughs> no, and the Earth Alliance uses that to their benefit because there's a few times where they're, they're able to like take out multiple colonies at once with like a laser. <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah so fragile for I mean, the preservation they, of our blue and pure world <laughs> blue cosmos i mean they look neat but yeah i think it's a bad functional design i don't blame the earth alliance for wanting to destroy those they're, they're an eyesore in space i only have one thing one more thing to say in gundam sea destiny it opens with an attempted colony drop or should i say half drop of the ruins of one of those plant colonies so hmm. Kudos for being uh, one of the Gundam series where they do a colony drop without an O'Neill type cylinder. Oh, there you go. All right, the next series in TV release order after Seed was Gundam 00, aka the Anno Domini area era. And from what I remember, nothing really good comes out of the colonies in this timeline. The Gundams are manufactured there. I think the government sends rebels there as like a punishment, and they also develop like super soldiers in the colonies in this in this show hmm. um I, I don't know maybe there was more plan for the colonies in this series but then those gray aliens came and you know nothing else mattered after that huh yeah i don't remember the colonies figuring too heavily into it it was very much a land war between the gundams and the uh, the superpowers and trying to get them to sort of move towards becoming a one world government 
the one colony that we do see <clears throat> is is based on what's called a Bernal sphere. Uh, that was proposed by Irish scientist John Desmond Bernal in 1929. And it's huh. basically just kind of like a sphere filled with air that doesn't rotate or anything. Um, the one in double O has this sort of big solar power, I don't know, it kind of looks like a solar sail to me. It's kind of just attached yeah. to it. You know what? I'm not a fan of this colony. It just, it doesn't look great. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why they didn't spend a whole lot of time there in the series. Similar to the seed colonies, uh, I do think this one looks a little fragile. Like, I feel like if you just went and cut off that solar sail, they'd kind of be screwed. Yeah, it, I, I imagine a few glancing shots on the surface will will doom the colony. Yeah, I mean, I guess they don't fight that much around the colony, no. if I remember right. So maybe it's not a huge yeah. concern. But yeah, it didn't seem as robust. You know? Yeah, Gundam 00 pretty much replaced the colony action with space elevator action. <laughs> <laughs> like that's where all like a lot of battles and a lot of important events happen. They always had to do with the space elevators and the solar arrays and all that. Yeah, the space elevator, to their credit, was super cool. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. Also, the only one we've seen in Gundam so far, to my knowledge. Well, actually, no, I take that back. Reconquista in G had a uh, was literally all about, I think, their space elevator. Mm. But um, yeah. we'll get to that when we get to that. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess one overall thing I would like to say about space colonies is that besides the Bernal sphere, the other scientific designs that Gundam has used, you'll notice they were all, for the most part, proposed in the 1970s, which, as Isaac said, was the time of the you know the space race um, and the Cold War kind of era. If you just think back to that time, can you tell that it, the 1970s were a great time to be alive if, if you loved space or if you were a space fan? I mean, Gundam came out, Star Wars came out, Star Trek... Uh, it was still big, you know, like real scientists were, were talking about colonizing space and coming up with these designs. So I would encourage people who are interested in these designs to, you know, just Google them because there's a lot of cool, like, uh, artist renderings of these space colony designs from the 1970s. And they're really neat looking. And you can tell that, like, passion went into these things. And I, I don't know, I don't feel like we have that anymore for space. And it's, it's kind of a shame. I mean, maybe we're getting back to that a little bit with, with SpaceX and uh, Space Force. I guess I don't know. We'll we'll see. I'm, maybe I'm cautiously optimistic, but definitely check out those renderings if you can. Yeah, uh, to go off what Brian said, if you look at you know when these colonies were created and designed and the artist rendering, people were literally believing back then that we'd be at, at Jupiter by like 2001 and you know all that all these projections that we had back in the day during the space race we'd be farther along exploring the solar system and colonizing it just because of how much money was going into the space race and um because of the cold war so all that's gone away for better or worse and space travel now is just so so corporate really with blue origin and spacex like you said brian but um you know, it's it's interesting. It's almost like a peek at you know what if, what could have been in our uh, in our world's history. But um, th- right now, this is as close as we can get to seeing the colonies more or less uh, as scientifically accurate as possible. So, are you telling me that we could have had Gundams by now? <laughs> it's well within the realm of possibility, Brian. We just <laughs> need to find a a scientist named Dr. Manowski, <laughs> and everything else will fall into place. He needs he needs to find a magical particle and come up with a way to house it in a magical yeah. reactor <laughs> god the minowski particle does everything doesn't it it like it does. Stops, it does it stops radar it stops like well no you, you the only way you can look for someone is visually it like it destroys um beam weapons at long range right <laughs> <laughs> what doesn't it do yeah that's magic uh, i think we covered everything in terms of colonies yeah oh wow everything did you hear that the drops <laughs> That was a big, uh, that was a big explosion. Did you hear that? Yeah, boom! I think you're under attack. I think you need to. Oh uh, man, it's calling dropping. Yeah, That's comment nice. below if you think Brian needs to uh, get in his mobile suit, <laughs> report to his team. <laughs> oh, did you want to talk about colonies that you liked, Isaac? You know what? As loyal as I am to Zeon, I don't like the closed type. I like the <laughs> open type. The open type is way more iconic. I don't want to be in. <laughs> I don't want to be in a Stanford tourist at all. I don't even want to visit it. It looks terrible. <laughs> Uh, how about you do you have a favorite type of colony i don't want to be Uh, in a plant either definitely the o'neill cylinder again i think if i was in a plant i'd be worried that my 
home was going to detach from its other half <laughs> at any given moment of the day. What if a strong solar wind blew by and just detached you? I'd, I'd be terrified. Or be terrified the, uh, <laughs> the naturals would fly by any moment and throw a nuke at your, at your window. <laughs> the, uh, the Bernal sphere just seems a little boring to me. And yeah, the, the, the Stanford Taurus is just a, just a bit ugly. There you have it, folks. Comment below if you prefer a different type of colony. I have a feeling there's definitely going to be a few Gundam Wing fans that think the, the Stanford Taurus is the best <laughs> colony in the world. So you can uh, go there with Hiro Yui and have your, your romantic getaway. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to they're gonna go Operation Meteor on you for, for attacking Apparently. them. Well, you know what? i got enough <laughs> Zeon to support me and stop your little colony drop. We know all about colony drops here at Zeon. We don't just launch them. We know how to stop them. <laughs> <laughs> they're the originator of the colony drop. So that wraps up our coverage of space colonies in the Gundam universe. Like, comment, and subscribe. Let us know what colonies you like, what colonies you don't like. Tell us what country you're from, and if you were designing a colony in G Gundam, <laughs> what your colony in space would look like. <laughs> That's a great idea. We should give away a prize for the one we like the best. Sure. What should we give away? I don't know. <laughs> An extra model um, that I have laying around. We can't tell you what scale it would be, but we know you'll you'll get a model. <laughs> Something from Brian's closet. And that'll uh, be a, a new feature of the podcast. Random giveaways. Yep. <laughs> the closet Gundam. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever's in there, you're going to get. So, Isaac, this whole discussion about space colonies has had an ulterior motive, hasn't it? It did. This was a plot? A secret Xeon plot? What was the plot? The plot was this whole discussion, this whole episode, is actually going to lead into the next episode, which will be about... Dun, dun, dun. Perhaps colony drops? <gasps>